I'm at Smith & Walensky in Midtown Manhattan, and we are here with a tourist today. Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, is here to pay off on a lunch that was auctioned away for Glide. And Warren, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I know that this lunch is very important to you. This time around, uh, the auction went for $2.679 million for this lunch today. Um, over 18 years that you've been doing with this with Glide, you've raised over $25 million. Um, it's a little unusual for you to focus on a charity like this because you have given so much to other foundations that give away money. Why, why is this charity is so important to you? Well, it's run by a, a very special a man, Cecil Williams, who in the early 1960s was assigned as a minister to a, uh, a church that was on the way down. It was in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. It had about 110 or 20 white parishioners, and Cecil was black, so the 120 went down very fast when he arrived there, and, and so he started from scratch, and he built a remarkable church, but really a remarkable social organization. He, he helps the people that, that the world has given up on, and he never gives up on anyone. Uh, there was that movie, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, with, with Will Smith that showed the glide operation. Uh, my wife told me a lot about Cecil, and I, I thought this sounds too good to be true, and I'm a suspicious guy by nature. Uh, so she didn't sell me, but then she took me there one time at the Glide, and I got to meet Cecil. I got to see what happened with the, the kind of people he was helping and how he was helping them. They served 700 and some thousand meals last year, and uh, they, they, they really take people who have hit bottom and, uh, and help bring them back, and uh, he's been doing it for decades. and. He's a remarkable man, and and if, if we can help out in raising some money for him, I enjoy doing it. That's great. Um, I, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about another area of the country that is in pretty dire straits right now. That's uh, Texas, Houston specifically, yeah. and now Louisiana, as the rain continues to fall from Hurricane Harvey. Uh, I've, I've seen some pretty enormous estimates of damage, um, and obviously the, the human loss uh, has been heartbreaking. Um, what, what's your sense of this storm, of the damage that's been done here? Well, it, it's sort of unbelievable. I, I, I saw a figure the other day of 14 million, uh, 14 trillion gallons of water being dropped from the skies. That's equal to 2,000 gallons of water for every man, woman, and child on the planet. I mean, it, it, so it, it's, it's staggering. And uh, uh, the Insured loss will be large. There'll be a lot of uninsured loss too, because flood. Uh, a lot of people have coverage with the national flood uh, operation, but uh, in the case of our particular company, uh, we write about 10% of the auto insurance in Texas. So if you have comprehensive insurance, which covers flood, uh, and about 70% of the people who buy auto insurance get that. Um, uh, you may very well have a total loss. We, have, we probably have 500,000 or so cars insured in that area. Through Geico. Uh, for Geico, yeah. which would be about 10% of the total. There'd probably be 5 million cars in that area. And we don't know at this point, but I wouldn't be surprised if we had 50,000 uh, uh, losses, and most of them will be total losses. That number's about the same as we had in Sandy, but our market penetration up here in, in New York is higher than in in Texas, uh, but we, we we have to get tens of thousands of cars in there because a person's got enough trouble with their house and everything else, but they need a car, and mm -hmm. and we we want them to have a full tank of gasoline. So we've been we've been taking on big big tankers of gasoline. It's it's how you perform at a time like this that really defines you know whether uh, your insurance company is doing the right job. Yeah, I, I have seen some estimates of losses. Um, J.P. Morgan was suggesting maybe 10 to 20 billion dollars in insured losses. The CEO of Farmers was on our air yesterday and suggested that it could be 150 billion in uninsured losses. Do those sorts of numbers make sense to you? How, how much of a feel do you have for this? Well, nobody has too good a feel, but the, the, those don't strike me as silly in any way. Uh, it, there will be a high proportion of uninsured losses to insured losses compared to most events, uh, because if there's just a straight hurricane, everybody collects on their own homeowner's insurance. But uh, uh, fortunately, they did have some warning, a fair amount of warning on this, so there was a lot of evacuation that took place. 
but it's it's just got to be devastating. Uh, we have six furniture stores, Star Furniture in the Houston area, and I was with those people yesterday, the day before yesterday, it was yesterday, and and uh, uh, they hope to open up on Saturday. Uh, uh, but it's you know it, the effects of this are going to go on for a very very long time. What other exposure does Berkshire have, aside from Geico, aside from some of the furniture stores that are there? Uh, not like we used to. We, we used to write a lot of what we call Super Cat. In fact, we were the biggest writers of Super Cat some years ago. And then they didn't have any hurricanes for a long time. It's been 10 or 11 years since uh, a hurricane hit land in the United States. And, and you can go back to 1840 or so, which is the longest record we have. And there's really never been that long a period without a hurricane coming ashore. So the rates kept coming down and down and down. And uh, the wind doesn't know what the rates were. So <laughs> if, if you get the wrong rate on, a, on, a, uh, on insurance, uh, you know, you're going to lose money over time. And so as the rates went down, we, we, we got out of the super cat business uh, pretty much entirely. So it does not hit us big in reinsurance like it would have if it had been 10 years ago. Is that part of the problem with the National Flood Insurance Program um, that is looking at some massive amounts of debt that it owes to the U.S. Treasury, something like $25, $26 billion? Yeah, the, the problem with flood insurance is that the only people that buy it are the people that are going to need it, uh, uh, where it's going to happen. You know, if I have a house uh, that's higher up in Omaha, I'm, I'm never going to buy flood insurance. So you don't get the spread of risk that you get with auto or homeowners. Uh, Nobody knows when a fire uh, is going to hit a house or something of the sort. That, that's random. But it's not random on floods. And so people that live in floodplains uh, are the only ones who want to buy flood insurance. And the normal insurance industry can't take care of it when you get adverse selection like that. So the government stepped in. They're already in the hole before this happened. And they'll be a lot further in the hole when this gets through. Usually what happens after a hurricane hits land like this, though, rates can come back up for insurance. If that's the case, would you start insuring again? I don't think they'll go up that much. But, but if, if, if super cat rates get to where we think that the odds are in our favor, we'll write it. But that's, it's been five or six years since we've written any real amount of super cat here in the United States. The rates just keep going down and down and down. And there's more and more houses on the coast, and they're worth more money. And... Uh, uh, and there's been a lot of money come in from outside the insurance industry with, with cat bonds. Uh, so it, it, it's, it has not struck me as a good business in recent years. Uh, let's talk about the potential impact on GDP. Um, we had Mark Zandi on today, and he suggested that it would probably not be a massive impact on GDP. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I, yeah, I would say it. it, it, it I, mean, my, I don't think it would be a full percentage point per year or anything like that. Uh, but it has a real effect. It destroys wealth. Yeah. And it just, it's, if there's 150 billion or something of uninsured losses, that's, that's real wealth. Uh, but we are a very wealthy country, and we create wealth at a, at a big rate, too. Let's talk about GDP, because we did get a second quarter read on the second quarter GDP today. It was 3%, and that was quite a bit better than people had anticipated. Does this feel like a 3% GDP economy to you? No. Uh, it's been about. 2% a year now for since the fall of 2009, uh, you know, eight years, and it's been remarkably close to that most of the time. The way they report those quarterly numbers is they take the quarter and multiple change and multiply by four. It's not year over year. Uh, so it gets a little uh, tricky that way. If you're off by a tenth, it makes it four tenths in the annual figure they report. And, and with seasonal adjustments and everything, you never want to take any quarter too seriously. I, I would guess we're in about a 2%. Uh, growth economy now and and as I've said it every now and then we think it's accelerating and every now and then we think maybe there's a double dip or something and it just seems to be a couple percent and certain industries will pick up quite fast the autos caught on faster than homes but now they're tailing down and uh, but two percent is not bad incidentally no two, two percent will make if we had two percent uh, for a generation 25 years uh, you would have a $19,000 GDP gain per person in the United States. It's not bad, but how do you explain a 10-year that hit 2.1% yesterday? 
How do I explain what hitting? The, the, the ten-year note oh. hitting a yield of 2.1 well, percent yesterday. If I'd, if I'd known that was coming, I'd have done a lot of things that were intelligent five years ago. No, it's it's sort of unbelievable that rates have stayed down. I mean, it's it's not what anybody expected. At least I didn't expect it, and, and the, uh, the other people at Berkshire didn't expect it. And 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 it it's uh, you know. I can remember when I was at Solomon in 1991, and they thought that the surest trade around was to short the Japanese 10 year bond because you couldn't have rates that low. And, and 26 years later, those people are st still uh, licking their wounds. They used to call that the widow maker, that, that trade. <laughs> you know, Warren, let me ask you uh, about North Korea because I know that this is an area that you've had a lot of concerns about. President Trump tweeted this morning and he said, uh, the U.S. talking to Korea and paying them extortion money for 25 years, talking is not the answer. What do you think about that and how concerned are you about the situation right now, given the missile launch that went over Japan this week? I've been concerned since 1945 when the first atomic bomb was used. Uh, we have developed over these 72 years uh, uh, since August of 1945 the ability to and around the world, other people have helped the, the, the ability to, to almost destroy civilization. And, and uh, it's the only real cloud on her rise. I mean, we got a million problems always in the country of one sort or another. Uh, they get solved. This one is the ultimate problem because if Kennedy and Khrushchev hadn't behaved well in, in, in the 1960s, you know, there might have been millions of Americans killed. Uh, and who knows what can happen? And you have people around the world, you have individuals, you have groups, and you have a, maybe a few nations who would like to inflict enormous damage on, on us or others of, uh, in the world. And, and we can be successful 99.9% .9 of the time in thwarting those efforts, but it's a worst case problem and the damage can be huge. And, and North Korea is a, a classic example. I mean, they. Here is a relatively poor country spending a lot of their funds on developing an ICBM, maybe that can hit the United States. Well, that you know that doesn't make any sense if they're doing it just because they like to play with Tinker Toys or something. Right. Uh, and the more people that you have that have that ability, the more generations you go through of different leaders, you know, the more likely is that eventually something happens that's the equivalent of what's happened in Texas in the last week, something that's a very remote probability. You, ex you roll the dice enough times and, and something finally happens. And North Korea is, you know, who knows what's in the mind of that fellow. Uh, and who knows what will be in his mind five years from now. It, it's a more dangerous world, obviously, as more people get those weapons. Warren, I, I know we're tight on time today. Jim Cramer has something that's called the lightning round, and I wonder if you'll play lightning round with me for some of your stock holdings so we can run through <laughs> some of these. Uh, first of all, shares of Apple. You're the largest shareholder in Apple. Um, I'm not sure we're the largest, but we two, have 2.5% two two and and percent. Percent in, in Apple. <clears throat> and uh, you have been very positive on this stock. Do you continue to look at it as a very positive holding? What are your thoughts on it, and have you continued buying? Well, originally, about 10 million shares of Apple. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, originally, about 10 million shares were bought by one of the fellows in the office. Todd or Ted? Which Todd or Ted. Right. <laughs> and then I looked at it, and then I bought considerably more. Um, in the last quarter, the one we reported here not long ago, June 30th, uh, he sold some of his shares. I bought more than he sold. So our overall holdings went up, but his holdings were reduced by about two thirds or thereabouts. Huh. Uh, so there was a net gain for Berkshire, uh, but that was composed of of uh, the fellow who bought it, uh, deciding he needed money for something else. He, he manages 11 billion, but. Both of the two manage about 11 billion that work for me, but that's all they manage. Uh, so when they get some new idea, they have to sell something. Uh, I've got a lot of excess money around, so, so uh, he decided that he wanted to go heavier into something else. Uh, 
but I've never sold a share, uh, and I've bought, I've bought stock. So are you continuing to buy? Well, I, I don't think I'll tell you that much, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, w I certainly was buying last quarter, and I don't pay attention to the calendar when I'm buying. <laughs> well, let's talk about another holding. Maybe we'll try this one more time. On the flip coin, IBM, last time we had talked to you, you had sold many shares of right. IBM. Are you still uh, dubious about uh, IBM's recovery process? Well. They may well do extremely well in the future, but I was wrong in my original analysis. And, you know, that's my fault. Uh, so five or six years ago, uh, I thought that their prospects were going to be better in the next five or six years than they turned out to be, significantly better. And uh, so I decided that, that I had made a mistake. Uh, that doesn't mean, sometimes I make two mistakes. Sometimes I make a mistake when I buy and when I sell. But, uh, so I, I, I still don't know that much about the future, but I feel I know more about, I'm, I feel more certain about the future as I look at a, a company like Apple than when I look at IBM now. Have you continued to sell IBM shares? Well, <laughs> there again, nice try. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to wait for the quarterly filings. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, let, let's talk about the bank stocks. Just last night, Berkshire went ahead and converted its warrants into shares yeah. of Bank of America, making you the largest shareholder in Bank of America and in Wells Fargo, two of the top three banks. Uh, what's the profit there? Eleven and a half billion dollars. Is that correct? Over that's about right. Over the last six years in that mm -hmm. stock, and do you continue to have faith in Bank of America? Yeah, I actually said specifically today that you know, a long, long time before we sell a share of Bank of America. Uh, we're very happy. We got 700 million shares, and, and uh, you know, I I, uh, I I like the business. I, I like the valuation, and that, uh, I like the management very much. So, so, that I think you'll see that for a long time in our holdings. Is it a similar story with Wells Fargo? Tim Sloan just came out recently and said that because of a third-party review at Wells Fargo, there are probably going to be some negative headlines yeah. that, that, that that create more uh, negative headlines for what's been happening there, their management policies. Yeah, well. What you find is there's never just one cockroach in the kitchen. You know, and when you start looking around, that was what used to terrify me at Solomon is what they'd find after the first one. Because any time you put the focus on an organization that's hundreds of thousands of people working for it, uh, you may very well find that it wasn't just the one that misbehaved that you found out about it. And, of course, it was more than one in, in, in the Wells Fargo case. But it, and you know, in, in the Solomon case. Or the Wells Fargo. So, are, you compare, case, are you comparing Wells Fargo and no, Solomon? No, no, but I'm comparing the the shock sort of 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 of, of an, a huge financial institution that, that all of a sudden people view in a different light and and uh and once that ha once you put a spotlight on and start looking at everything you're likely to find something additional is that enough to concern you uh, in terms of your ownership of the shares not in terms of long-term investment no no okay. it's a it, it, it's a terrific bank, as is the B of A, and, and uh, there were some things that were very wrong done there, but they are being corrected. And, and my guess is, if you look at any institution that's around, for long, I mean, something something's going wrong at Berkshire right now, and I wish I knew about it. But I mean, and we have methods of trying to make sure we do find out about it. But I can guarantee you, with 367,000 people, you know, every one of them isn't behaving in a way that uh, that uh, I would like. Uh, Warren, let me ask you about Amazon and Whole Foods. Uh, I'm asking in the context of Kraft Heinz, and I realize that there are not a lot of Kraft Heinz products that are sold at Whole Foods, but this merger and the lowering of prices at Whole Foods has put some enormous pressure on the shares of grocery sellers, something like $12 billion in the top four grocery, grocery sales stores. Uh, shares was lost in market capitalization just last yeah. week. That puts a lot of pressure on those grocery stores to then um, improve their margins. They're going to yeah. do it on the backs of companies like Kraft Heinz. Do you worry about how profitable that company can be with all this pressure that's well, out there? Well, there's always a huge struggle. It's gone on for decades and decades and decades between brands and retailers. I mean, the, and to some extent, retailers try and create their own brands. That's why they have private label. Uh, but brands are hugely important, and the retailer is hugely important. And, uh, the retailer is always trying to get the upper hand in those negotiations. The the, uh, the the brand manufacturer is trying to do it through advertising and through all kinds of things. So it, it's always a struggle. And when you get 
particularly strong retailers, a Walmart, uh, a Costco, and now an Amazon, and they keep getting stronger, their position improves. And particularly, uh, it, packaged goods have had more trouble uh, building followers through advertising in recent years. Martin Sorrell was just talking about that uh, the other day. So that struggle is tilting perhaps toward retailers. You've got the big German operations coming in on discount, and they, they feature their own brand. So, so that, that'll always be a fight, but right now, the, the retailer is, is, is doing better in this round of the fight. Yet generally, the way to fight against that is to get even bigger. So would Kraft Heinz go after a company like a Mondelez, whose shares have improved just in the yeah, last recent That sessions? doesn't really help you that much in the fight. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, P&G was always thought of as having the ultimate muscle because they were so big in so many brands. But it, it does help to have a group of big, powerful brands if you're negotiating with a big retailer. But what they really care about is the strength of the specific brand. I mean, and you know, we have Duracell batteries, and the, the real question with people carrying that versus carrying some other brand is what they, how they feel the consumer feels about that brand when they walk in. And, and uh, so if you have five items that might be served at dinner, uh, that doesn't really make you a lot stronger than having one. Are you saying that Mondelez's brands are not worthy? Of oh, no, no. Okay. No, I'm just saying that it, there's not the additive factor if you have 10 big brands versus one. I mean, it, if you decide to buy a Coca-Cola or a Sprite, uh, both from Coca-Cola, uh, the one doesn't influence the other. You probably don't even, many people don't even know that Sprite is made by, by Coca-Cola. So your positioning within the retailer, all he cares about is what's going to move, you know, basically. And uh, having a group of brands doesn't, doesn't translate to that much more bargaining power. So I'm not asking this directly enough. Would Kraft Heinz buy Mondelez? Uh, I think the answer is no on that. <laughs> Okay, there's a direct <laughs> answer to that. Um, would you go back after Unilever? Oh no, 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 no. That that was that, that was a misunderstanding. Basically, we will not make hostile take, uh, takeover offers, and we did not intend that to be hostile. But it turned out it was, and we, we immediately, the next day, when I learned about it, we, we called it off. It wasn't. It was a misunderstanding. Warren, very quickly, I want to go back to Tim Cook um, at Apple, the CEO there. He has been fairly outspoken recently um, about some of his disagreements with the Trump administration and with some of um, the actions of Donald Trump, the president. You have been uncharacteristically silent. In the past, you've been pretty outspoken about your politics. Why have you been silent now? Well, I worked for Hillary. I raised money for Hillary. I voted for Hillary. Uh, I was disappointed when she lost. Uh, but we have a, a, a president. and. You know, we have North Korea. We have a whole bunch of things. I, 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 I am not in the business of attacking any president, nor do I think I should be. Uh, uh, I've lived under 15 presidents, believe it or not. There's been 45 presidents in the United States, and I've lived under a third of them. And I bought stocks net under 14 of the 15. The first one was Hoover. And I was only two when he left, so I hadn't gotten active at that point. But Roosevelt came next, and I bought stocks under him, even though my dad thought it was the end of the world when he got elected. And I bought, I bought stocks under 14 out of 15. So uh, uh, I, th this, this country will move forward. But it, it's, it is important that government functions well. It's important that, that both from the government side and from the private side that they try to figure out how to how to maximize the degree to which this country moves forward. So uh, I'll, I'll take a position in the 2020 campaign, the 2018 for that matter. But I won't say if, if my candidate doesn't win, and probably half the time they haven't over the year, that you know, I'm going to take my ball and go home. <laughs> Uh, you know, you mentioned the 15 presidents you've lived under. Um, that's because you're 87 years old today. Yeah. Uh, we want to tell you happy birthday. And Smith and Lewinsky um, has put together a cake for you wow. uh, that they wanted to show you. Um, and we just want to wish you a very happy oh, birthday here today. Too bad Warren. there's not enough there for you. But. Uh... <laughs> <laughs>
That's, that's they, great. They that, put thanks, together Brocco. all of this, your favorite things. This is my guy, things. Brocco. He, yeah. he always delivers. <laughs> they put together some of your favorite things, and uh, I think you'll get a kick out of this today. But we want to thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank and, you. And uh, wish you a happy birthday, Warren. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Uh, Sarah, we'll send it back to you in the studio. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.